What's going on, Heavy here? And we're about to listen to Dr. Jared Ball at Morgan State University talk about the new series with MLKX that's gonna be on uh, Hulu and Disney and Nat Geo. Uh, he says some great things here. If you haven't subscribed to Black Power Media, please go ahead and subscribe. Big ups to Dr. Ball and the whole crew. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. You can see here some of the people featured in as, as cast. I'm sure they're very talented and beautiful people, but what is of most interest to me is this part here where there's a discussion and description of the think tank of historians and experts who served as production consultants prior to the start of the writer's room to guide the production, including in alphabetical order, Jamal Joseph, who I did reach out to and invited to, to discuss this and should he ever respond, I'll let any, I'll let you all know, and hopefully maybe he'll join us here. And if not here, elsewhere, and we'll happily check that out as well. But of course, my main concern is was seeing this. We already heard his voice and saw him featured prominently in the trailer. Uh, I'm not at all surprised, and have been predicting for going on almost almost two decades now that Joseph would become a permanent problem in reproducing a neoliberal narrative of black radical histories and individuals. Links to previous work on that and even our debate, uh, I'll put in the show description. You can check that out for yourselves, but I'm not surprised and again, have even predicted he would be here. Uh, Barbara Reynolds, if folks wanna go back, I'll make sure that's in the show description as well. She is discussed by my godfather, Mr. Tom Warner, in a very critical way uh, for, for her versions of him and Jesse Jackson in her previous work. Uh, noted here, Jesse Jackson's America, America's David. And I also would want to note Jeff Stetson because it, it says here that the meeting he, that he, he authored, of course, the, the famous play going back several decades now, uh, the meeting between Dr. King and, and Malcolm X, a fictional depiction of them having a meeting. I did go back and watch it, a version of it at least on YouTube, um, and was reminded of what I've always thought it to be, a very, with all due respect, sophomoric introduction to the two men, and that does what I fear is being done in a new version in this forthcoming film. It just sort of sets up that, that base. Again, sophomoric juxtaposition of King versus Malcolm. And what if we had put our put down our our our? What if we had joined forces forces earlier? And what what we could have done? Again, no real discussion of their radical politics ever increasing, particularly for Dr. King. No discussion of the state. No discussion of counter of the counterintelligence program. No discussion of assassinations. No discussion of of all of the broader anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, radical politics that both men were increasingly involved with and, and, and targeted and assassinated for. So it's perfect that he would be uh, involved here, not only as having been the inspiration for the series, but having written the pilot for it and serving as executive producer. So I think these are warning signs as to what we can expect we're going to get from uh, this, this forthcoming series. Now, also, as this Blavity article reminds us, this is a Disney product. Disney owns National Geographic, or I think 70 plus percent of it. It's airing on Hulu, which is a Disney product. Uh, so we should be reminded of this, and, and we've discussed this previously about, about what this means, and I'll even put the link in the show description where we talked about not only our, our, what, what this means in terms of these histories becoming Disney products, but that Disney and, and what it means when Disney and Disney-like companies are actually the ones owning the likenesses uh, to these figures like Malcolm X. I don't think it's Disney in particular that owns Malcolm's likeness, but that company is discussed in that video we did about a year or so ago, so I'll put that in the link description. The point being, these histories, these images, these likenesses, these, these windows to our past, are not controlled by us. They're not owned by us. They're not designed with a frame for us to access these histories and people for any act for the purposes that those people themselves had. 
and for us to pick up the radical traditions that they represented and to advance them that's not why they exist they exist i think dr ball hit it on the head right here our windows into the past are being controlled by some of the largest corporations in the world so how in the world are they going to release a version of the past that is antithetical to them they will not they will not release any rebellious type material to us because they don't want us to get the idea that we should pick up that baton and run with it and do the same things that Malcolm and Martin were doing. That's his point, is that if we're looking to these large platforms to give us the radical versions of Malcolm and Martin, we're sadly mistaken. Because if they want to stay in business, they're going to control that likeness of Martin and Malcolm and release a sanitized, whitewashed, conservative, liberal-leaning version of these characters so that we turn into them. They don't want us to turn into the real versions of Martin and Malcolm. They want us to turn into the versions of them that they're releasing to us. So when we look in the past, we see what they want us to see. Dr. Ball is on point here. Do quite the opposite. That was, and again, it's the point of the, the, the comical reference, both to the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance, to the penny trick that, that it, the, of Peniel Joseph, the, the, the nominal reference to individuals and histories that have, that are themselves radical and revolutionary, but are depicted in very neoliberal frames so that when they are passed on to our youth, again, much like the fifth tenet of the counterintelligence program directed at black communities dictates, mandate. Now, a lot of teachers don't do this, but I pull up the FBI website and let them read the counterintelligence program because one of the bullet points is that we should not allow black youth to get in contact with any of these radical histories and that we are to separate, we being the government, the government, including the FBI, should be trying to separate the youth from these radical traditions and histories. It says it right on the website. I'm paraphrasing it because I can't remember the exact wording. But the FBI still has the counterintelligence program on there where they talk about how they were watching and following Martin and Malcolm. And, and the, on the bullet points, like I'm saying, one of them was to make sure that the black youth are not connected with any of these nationalist organizations, these nationalist histories. So Dr. Ball is on point again. And, and I encourage more parents, more teachers to show kids how important they are. Because if the youth and their education was not important, why would it be so hard to change educational laws and curriculums and lesson plans? It's difficult because it's important and the government wants to make sure they control what information goes into the minds of our youth. In a way that will discourage black youth from becoming radical. And as the oppression of black people... Did you hear that? The counterintelligence program knew that. They don't need our youth turning into radical people that is going to challenge the status quo and try to create a different society. That's the whole point. They want to give us sanitized versions so we become sanitized versions ourselves and just sit back and let the system do what it does instead of disrupting things being rebellious, being a problem, a nuisance. Continues, there needs to be a constant assault on the consciousness of those communities, and in particular, the radical traditions that might inform revolutionary responses to that ongoing oppression. So just as we see here, now, I, I did mention, I, I, I think I mentioned it in, maybe it was in, a, in, a, in, a, in another instance or edit, but I thought that it would be interesting to do a series that focused on Betty and Coretta. If you're going to juxtapose people, it would be interesting to see if, if those two are, are would be the, the, actually given the, the due that they deserve as individuals and, and also representatives of broader histories and struggles. Uh, what would, it would be interesting to see them get 
centered. But again, not here. <laughs> as much as I would like to see the lives of Betty Shabazz and Coretta Scott King depicted and given more attention, I don't want it to be in the context that their husbands are constantly, posthumously abused. Uh, but according to Blavity, this series is going to bring their wives, Coretta Scott King and Betty Shabazz, who are often portrayed as peripheral figures to the forefront and shows them as formidable equals of the movement. And then it goes on to point out, as we saw in the trailer, that neither Malcolm nor Martin would be have, have become who they were without the other. So also, again, I want to just quickly bring up a point or two I made uh, or have been trying to make in, in for, for a number of years uh, and is discussed in this presentation that I put together some years ago and the one attempt at a Prezi I ever uh, uh, engaged. It was, it's not a very well done Prezi. The content is dope and accurate, of course, but the, the, the presentation is, 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 it is, it is what it is. But, but there's a couple uh, points from this that I wanted to make that are, are uh, I think, predictably coming up again in this, this framing and, and the way Malcolm and Martin are juxtaposed. Now, again, there is, I think, a, a, a valuable way it could be done. That is the juxtaposition of Malcolm against Martin, the kinds of politics they represented, the paths to, to their conclusions that they, that they took, et cetera, and so forth. I think there is value there. I think some of that work has been done well in the past. Uh, I was even thinking, was it uh, James Cone had a book, I think, uh, comparing the two of them and their religious approaches or something like that. Maybe we should get get a copy for Diallo. Uh, but but what is often done is is as I think is described in some of the research I found for this for this pre pre presentation some years ago that I think is still of value here. So I just wanted to bring renewed attention to it. First, just again to remind, immediately after the March on Washington, William Sullivan working on behalf of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover was already saying that we must mark Dr. King now if we have not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro and national security. We've talked about this before repeatedly. This was also in the context of a fear that King's leadership would, would take black people towards an affinity for and defense of and solidarity with the Cuban revolution. So even with this- See, you see that? the FBI is always keenly aware of those people who are able to garner the attention of more than just the people in that racial group. So Dr. King was reaching out to people who are not only black in America, but white in America, Asian in America, Hispanic in America, and as we see, the Cubans who are not even in America. So that's dangerous to the United States. So William C. Sullivan took notice and said, yo, this man is dangerous. He's gonna disrupt our social order, right? Because if you disrupt the social order of this country, that means things are about to change for black folks and everybody else. Even the elite, the elite will be challenged. That's what they don't want. They don't want people thinking we should challenge the structure of our country because that will disrupt the social order, make people at the top feel very uncomfortable. The relatively soft and liberal, I have a dream speech. Dr. King was already moving beyond mainstream civil rights, what was sanctionable by the state and mainstream civil rights. And it was noted already by the highest levels and the most vicious levels of the federal government. So what I've always just wanted to quickly try to point out, and again, we can assess this and I'll predict that it's not gonna appear uh, in, in this forthcoming series, but this is sort of the point that I've been trying to make as it relates to these two and that we how we see them, what we see not considered when each are themselves considered individually or certainly, again, in juxtaposition against the other. And that is just quickly, in each case, Malcolm and, and Martin, ex they both express deep commitments to black unity and extending that unity to global anti-colonial and anti-imperial struggles. Both expressed a fealty to anti-capitalist ideas. Both expressed strong and particular criticism of the black bourgeoisie and white liberals. 
both expressed zero confidence in legislation and conventional methods of protest politics. Again, both were advocating that we differently approach electoral politics, not simply voting for the lesser of evil or to stop one or another. Do you hear that? Dr. King and Malcolm X were not running around talking about, you just need to vote because our ancestors died for us to vote. Vote or die. You did not hear Dr. King and Malcolm X spewing that type of rhetoric. Instead, they were trying to figure out alternative ways to get around electoral politics. Yes, it's a part of our country, but it's not the only part. Voting once every two to four years is not the only part of politics. And they know that. Think about it. When slavery ended, when Jim Crow ended, did it end because there was this huge plebiscite and people just voted on it? Was it a referendum? No. There were individual political moments in history that led to the Civil War and the ending of slavery people organizing people put pushing back together in an organized fashion to, to end slavery and then to end Jim Crow it was multiple political moments in history that led to this and, and it wasn't just one big vote that ended it all that, that's what we gotta learn we gotta learn that there's alternative methods politically that we can use get to where we want to get and it's not just voting fascist this that or the other and then lastly both express support for direct act oh and, and i hope you see here for the people that don't know anti-colonial and anti-imperialist that's what both of them were so that just means that dr king and malcolm x were against countries expanding their empire to a place they don't belong so like how the British took over the land of North America and put colonies here, the 13 colonies, that's colonialism. And you know how countries get, con like America controls, like Puerto Rico and Guam. They're in, in, with imperial power. They didn't necessarily put US colonies on those places. They use their imperial power to do that. So colonialism and imperialism are pretty much the same. You're extending your empire to a foreign land. Dr. King and Malcolm were against that. And they were against the support of the black bourgeoisie. That's what a lot of people don't realize. And that, and that makes, because a lot of our black bourgeoisie are educated. So that's why a lot of them will have very conservative views. Because if you're going to be radical like Martin and x that's going to disrupt what the conservatives are doing it's going to make it uncomfortable for them those people that have money and they're in spaces with the upper middle class and the upper class going to make them feel uncomfortable they're going to not want to support such movements because it's going to make life different for them because <laughs> a lot of them are on the coattails of the elite And I don't know to what extent, particularly that point will be made clear. I'm, I have zero confidence that point will be made clear in this series. If anything, they're going to try to make it seem like King, uh, that Malcolm was walking away from armed struggle and King t towards a King uh, that was seen as, uh, as representing those politics. But even as the counterintelligence program documents stated themselves, they were concerned that if King left his adherent, his obedience for liberalism and nonviolent doctrines he would become the number one threat to the state but it was his direct action campaigns and advocacy calls that made him the threat and that are often ignored when king is himself considered malcolm never disavowed armed struggle self-defense and even guerrilla warfare so we can be i guarantee that will not be depicted correctly if at all in this series but that is a point that that did you hear that again? He's saying that in this new series, they're not going to highlight the fact that Malcolm was all for armed struggle, guerrilla warfare, nor will they bring up the fact that they were scared that Dr. King might 
adopt the same view on armed struggle and guerrilla warfare because they knew that if King did that, a lot of people will follow that and that <laughs> armed struggle or guerrilla warfare will be a real thing to deal with here in the U.S. He said, this series is not going to touch that. They, they, no, and I agree. There's no way they want our youth thinking that it's okay to defend yourself and attempt to end your oppression in an armed struggle way. No way. Uh, great job, Dr. Ball. I love what you're doing here, man. We need more of this.